think of the Divine Lord and pray for the peace and prosperity of the whole humanity. Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Om Stavakaya Jadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Sabakaya Jadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Avatar Varishthaya Rama Krishna Yatenama Asato ma sad gamaya Tamaso ma jo der gamaya Brityor ma brithan gamaya Om Shandishandishandi Let us bow down to Sri Ramakrishna. The embodiment of all legends, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. We have been discussing the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. In the last class, I had referred to an aspirant asking the question to Sri Ramakrishna. Is it possible to see God? Very direct question. Sri Ramakrishna, who had seen God, could only replay very emphatically in what manner God could be seen, whether it was possible to see God, This question could be answered only by one who had seen God. And here is Sri Ramakrishna, who had seen God, who had talked with God, who was always filled with God consciousness, who was the embodiment of purity. So his answer was very clear and the path also is very clear. Sri Ramakrishna answered him Why God could not be seen in spite of your desiring to see Him? What is responsible for not seeing God? And Sri Ramakrishna pinpoints, he says, He cannot be seen. You cannot know Him till your mind is engaged or engrossed in worldliness. 
If the mind is projecting outwards, if the mind is involved in the, in the play of this world, when you are engaging yourself in this game of the world, you cannot see him. It is not possible to see God as long as your mind is engrossed in worldliness. Further he points out that one cannot attain God if a person has even a trace of attachment to lust and gold. If your mind is lust, full of lustful thoughts, if your mind is hankering after gold, then it means the mind is occupied in the worldliness. So, when the mind is attached to these things, certainly you cannot see him. Attachment of the mind means full mind is not given to the devotional practices. Until the full mind is turned towards God, you cannot see Him. But He is knowable. You can see Him if your mind is purified. Through the purified mind and through pure intelligence that have not the slightest trace of attachment, you can see God. So, now the purpose of religion is stated. What is this religion meant for? To make the mind pure. As and when the mind gets pure, it becomes more and more steady. More and more directed in one direction. So, you have to strive very hard to attain purity. That is the basis of spiritual life. You may have difficulties, but the fact remains A person well established in purity, he works so powerfully, he can transform others in their innermost character. He carries with him a great redemptive spiritual and moral power. You can study the life of Lord Christ, Sri Ramakrishna. You find it is a purity of Lord Christ. 
that rescued Mary Magdalene from terrible vice. No worldly wisdom or intellectual instruction could have achieved that. So, purity, purity, purity. You are struggling to attain purity, which is your true nature. There is a beautiful incident in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. How he was the embodiment of purity, so he could realize, he could see Divine Mother. There was a person by name Mathur Babu. He was the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. He was a caretaker of the great saint. He wanted to test Sri Ramakrishna's purity of character. So, he arranged the matter with some fallen girls. He had specifically instructed them to try all means to tempt Sri Ramakrishna so that his mind can be diverted from God so that mind could be involved in sense pleasure. So everything was arranged. Mathur Babi called Sri Ramakrishna, well master please come let us go for a while. So he took him in his carriage went near a home and stopped there, then went inside the apartment. Mathur Babu made, Mathur, made Sri Ramakrishna sit there and he told him he would come after some time. Then he left the place. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting in the room. What did he see? There were pretty girls well set to entrap him with their charms. No sooner did Sri Ramakrishna see them than with the simplicity of a child Sri Ramakrishna addressed them as mother. Oh Mother, he uttered three times the name of the Mother. He is recalling the Divine Mother into his mind and entered into a deep state of ecstasy. He lost all outward consciousness. His mind was totally experiencing the bliss of the Divine Mother. And Sri Ramakrishna, when he saw those girls, he did not see their moral degradation nor their ugly design. He was perfectly guileless. He thought every woman was the manifestation of the Divine Mother. So he couldn't see 
evil in anything. The childlike purity of his soul worked the miracle. The suppressed motherhood in these women was released. These girls repented their sins and determined to lead a fresh new life. So by the power of the purity of Sri Ramakrishna, these girls could change their ways of life. There is another story depicting the glory of purity in character. There was a young saint, his name was Rishya Shringa, a very famous saint, saint of India. He was practicing austerities in a forest. His, mon, his mind was totally absorbed in Brahman. He was untouched by any idea of evil. Because of his austerities and constantly dwelling on the divine spirit, he developed tremendous spiritual power. The king of the country commissioned some courtesans to divert the mind of the young saint from the path of rectitude. Early one morning, the saint, as usual, went to the lake for his daily ablution. The lake was covered with purple and white lotuses. The sun in all its morning glory peeped from the eastern horizon. The saint was standing on the waters and pondered over the purity of the creation. It was just lost in the thinking. He was in that state of perfect purity. Suddenly, there was a splash of water. He saw young girls of exquisite beauty smiling charmingly at him. They all looked at him. The pure soul of the saint saw in them the beauty of the Creator, the idea of lust never entered into his mind. As soon as he saw them, he addressed them as mother. And in that instant, all their evil designs were defeated. Then the ladies felt ashamed of their scheme. They went back to the king and told him, Well, you have sent us to that great saint. In a way we are blessed because you gave the opportunity for us to see him. What happened was we have been chastised by the pure look of the saint. He called us mother and the purity of the eternal mother in us asserted itself. O king, you always looked upon us as the objects of your enjoyment. We were the fire in which you constantly offered the oblation of lust and passion. You wanted to propitiate the devil in us and in your presence we always forgot the God who is our heritage. But 
Had we ever worshipped that divinity, you would have received in return the heavenly nectar of immortality. You wanted the clay of our physical charm. And so, we were always mere toys in our hands. But the soul of this saint, which is innate purity, has restored our divinity. We have come to know by the grace of this saint that we are really pure and divine. The pure soul exerts its redemptive power over the evil-minded, not by emphasizing their evil nature, but by directly touching their essentially divine spark, which is never extinguished. That's why Swami Vivekananda, when he spread the message of Vedanta at the Parliament of Religions, he declared that each soul is potentially divine. You have that divinity in you. Everyone has got it. Whether he knows it or knows it not. Crookedness is unfamiliar to this saint of purity. He cannot impute hidden motives to anybody. He cannot comprehend the sordidness of the everyday world. This trustfulness is his great power and by it he disarms all equivocation and hypocrisy. Anyone who comes into the charmed circle of the pure soul at once feels his elevating influence. This is more convincing than the study of the holy books. So, we find all religions recommend the company of holy men as the greatest purifying agent in our life. The first step to improve your life is to come in association with spiritual persons who do practice spirituality in their life. Come in contact with them. You will see the wonderful effect upon your life. A pure man is the power of goodness become flesh. This is exemplified in the life of Lord Jesus. At the mere sight of him or by his mere word, calculation and subtlety were silenced. The Pharisees could never entangle him with their cunning logic. A pure soul goes directly to the heart of things. Neither heaven nor hell can keep its secrets from him. His penetrating insight unravels the mystery of everything. There may be darkness over a period of thousands of years, but it is instantly dissipated by the spark of light. So, the accumulated sin of ages disappears at the advent of a pure man. The power of purity is positive whereas evil is a non-existing entity which appears to exist only in our perverted imagination. It's a kind of pollution. It's because of this pollution we are seeing evil in the world. The presence of a pure soul in society is its greatest corrective force. Though he doesn't judge or condemn, yet he is a monitor, a wandering conscience 
for the impure. A pure soul by his silent presence destroys the atmosphere of anger, hatred, envy, resentment and the baser passions and restores the spirit of serenity and calmness. We find people coming to Sri Ramakrishna. They would feel immensely uplifted and purified in the presence of Him. That is the power of purity. In His presence, the impure soul, ready to chastise the impure act of another, hears the admonition. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Who is free from sin? Purity is a very bedrock of spiritual life. It is not an abstract virtue, but manifests itself in all our thought and in all our activity. A spiritual person preserves his purity in deed, word, thought, will and disposition. Our deeds, words and thoughts when inspired by purity, always bear a special impress. Purity of deed is straightforwardness, straightforwardness of action. Absence of all uh, subterfuge and freedom from concealment and cunning. Pure words do not admit of any double meaning ambiguity or offensiveness. When our thought is pure, it means the simple presentation of facts and absence of masked motives and ulterior purposes. The pure in disposition view with sameness, love and hatred, admiration and contempt, goodwill and anger because they cannot see evil anywhere. A pure person is incapable of envious admiration, jealous love or suppressed rage. He can never be a sneak. The one unmistakable characteristic of purity is that the possessor of it harmonizes his inward attitude with his outward his unconscious which is conscious. He is incapable of any duplicity. The purity of his will manifest itself in wholehearted and absolute surrender to the end in view. He never undertakes any work in a careless or light-hearted manner. One can trust him in everything. That is the glory of purity. According to the philosophy of Vedanta, the soul of a man is never contaminated. Man may be hypnotized into believing in the reality of worldly experience, but the divine spark of his true nature is never extinguished. That's why we see when the spiritual masters come, they give a kind of awakening to us. They make us aware of the divinity in us. The sun may be covered for the time being by a patch of cloud, but however dense it may be, it can never diminish the sun's resplendence. Take another example. Gold 
it may remain buried under earth for thousands of years but that cannot destroy its natural brilliance it has only to be dug out and the golden color at once reveals itself take another example flint may be under water for years but the moment it is taken out and rubbed against a stone it produces a spark the idea of impurity comes when we forget our divine nature the aspirant must assert with all the sincerity he can command i am divine nitya shuddha buddha mukta chidananda roopah shivoham shivoham that's the truth i am that pure eternal ever free blissful pure atman i am shiva that means i am that pure being that is my inner nature that is my true nature but this assertion must be done with all the forcefulness of his nature nothing in the world can destroy the divine element sin so called may hide or cover it but it can never destroy the divine element so when we achieve that purity in our life the question whether i could see god doesn't arise at all when you attain purity you are bound to experience god so we have to undertake spiritual disciplines with this idea of maintaining purity getting rid of all impurities cleaning all the dirt of the mind keep the mind clean then you will see the reflection of god in the mind page 575 Sri Ramakrishna had set out from Dakshineshwar for other's house in Calcutta. Narayan and Gangadhar were with him in the carriage. In an ecstatic mood, he said, "Shall I count the beads? How shameful that would be! This emblem of Shiva." has sprung from the bowels of the earth it is self created and not set up by man's hands they arrived at other's house where many devotees including kedar baburam and vijay had assembled vaishnavachar and the musician was present at the master's behest other heard vaishnavacharan's music daily after his return from the office when the master entered other's drawing room the devotees stood up to receive him kedar and vijay saluted him and the master asked narayan and baburam to salute kedar and vijay he asked kedar and vijay to bless narayan and baburam that they might have devotion to god pointing to narayan he said he is utterly guileless the eyes of the devotees were fixed on the two boys master to kedar and the other devotees he said it is good that i have met you all here otherwise perhaps you will have come to the kali temple to see me through the will of god however we have met here 
Kedar with folded hands. He said, the will of God, it's all your will. Sri Ramakrishna smiled. Vaishnava Charan began a kirtan about Radha and Krishna. When the music was nearing its end, with the union of Radha and Krishna, the master began to dance with ecstatic fervor. The devotees danced and sang around him. After the music, they all sat down. The master said to Vijay, referring to Vaishnava Charan, He sings very well. He asked the musician to sing this song about Sri Chaitanya, beginning with the line, The beautiful Gauranga, the youthful dancer, fair as molten gold. When the song was over, the master asked Vijay, How did you like it? Vijay answered, Wonderful. Sri Ramakrishna also sang a song about Sri Chaitanya. I am joining him. Then Vaishnava Charan sang another song. Oh my flute, sing Hari's name. You can't know the highest truth without Lord Hari's grace. His name removes our bitter grief. Repeat the name of Hari then. Repeat Sri Krishna's holy name. If he bestows his grace on me, no longer shall I be afraid of this unfriendly world. Sing then Lord Hari's name, my flute. Our only treasure is his name. Govinda says, Behold, my days are passing by in vain. In the world's deep and shoreless sea, O oh, let me not be drowned. Vaishnava Charan sang again, this time about Mother Durga. O tongue, always repeat the name of Mother Durga. Who but your Mother Durga will save you in distress? The master and the musician sang again and again the following lines from the song. The moving and the unmoving, the gross and the subtle art thou. Creation and preservation art thou, and the last dissolution. The word, the primal root of this manifold universe, the mother of the three worlds, their only saviour art thou. The word, the Shakti of all, and thou, thine own Shakti too. Kedar and several devotees stood up. They were about to return home. Kedar saluted the master and bade him goodbye. Shall stop here. So, success depends on practice. Spiritual practice, definite way of practicing is important. You must be very definite about what you are doing and you must take all precautions to see that mind doesn't run after the things of the world. If the mind runs after the things of the world, you become the slave of the mind, then it is impossible to have the vision of God, that means you will not be able to have real peace of mind. What is this coming back and forth in this world? Dying to born again, to die to born again, how long this will continue? As long as you have not realized the truth, you must keep on coming back and forth in spite of your liking or not liking. It's not in your hands. The nature forces you to take birth. It forces to die. It forces you to take birth again. Keep on doing this again and again. How many times nobody knows.
How many births nobody knows. But till the truth is realized, each individual will have to pass through this births and deaths. In other words, everyone is continuing his journey through repeated births to the final goal of reaching purity and perfection. That is, to realize his true nature. Then only your journey finds the end. Till then, we keep on going, going, going. That's all. Any doubts to ask? Any questions? Comments? Truth is like that. It may be difficult, it may be easy. Whatever you may say, truth is truth. If you have to have the experience of the truth, you have to follow disciplines, austerity. That means, mind should be properly positioned in the thinking of God. That's the purpose of initiation. That's the purpose of taking the mantra from the Guru. That's the purpose of concentrating on the mantra. By concentrating on the Divine Mantra which you have received from the Guru, that will awaken your consciousness. So, the Divine Spark is just kindled by the concentration of the mantra. Concentrate on the mantra, then you see how everything goes in a proper way. But concentration is not possible if the mind is extrovert. That's why in the Yoga Shastra it's always prescribed. You must withdraw all the senses from outgoing. Fix them inward. It's easy to say but difficult to follow. Difficult because all these years we have been habituated to see outside, projecting all our senses outside. We are so active outside, so we are feeling extremely difficult to withdraw the senses and close it and sit even for two minutes. It's not easy, but it must be done. Everything is easy, when you have a strong will power, I will do it, come what may. That's what Lord Buddha did when he sat under a tree for meditation. He said, I will not get up till I realize the truth, come what may. So, that zealousness, that vigor is important. You have got everything, but they are devoted in a wrong direction. In other words, you have devoted them towards the world and you are enjoying the world. Divert them towards God, you enjoy God. That's all. Simple. <laughs> very simple. Very simple, very difficult. Very difficult if the mind is not following you. Very simple if the mind follows you. But everything is to be done by one's own self. Any number of religions may come, any number of incarnations may come, any number of holy people may come. Still you have to do exercise to build up your body. By looking at my body, you can't, oh Swamiji looks very well, I must also be like that. Simply by thinking that way you will not be, unless you try to 
follow purity. That's real spirituality. That's what Sri Ramakrishna said. God can be seen only by the pure mind. The very fact you are not able to see God means your mind requires to be purified. That means you require to practice spiritual disciplines. That means you require guru, you require mantra, you require all these things too. Chain action. Anything else? Any question? But we shall stop. Chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiper clean and quench with that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. O name, stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening its cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, down deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name that bath for weary souls. Various are thy names, O Lord, in each and every name thy power resides. No time so set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. So vast is thy mercy, how huge then is my wretchedness, we who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name. O my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to thyself, give honor to all. Chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or renew. The playthings of lust are the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Oh, how I long for the day when an instant's separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years, when my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor prevailing the withdrawal of thy presence. Though it tears my soul asunder, O thou who still the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, May all realize what is good. May all be actuated by noble thoughts. May all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous reign tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good be died all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be plussed with drops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord the destroyer of sins. The presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied, for he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied. <laughs>